The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Sam, sweetheart. Any calls? Only one, Sam. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide. He wants you to drop around so they can get your formal statement. No hurry, not now. He told me what happened, Sam. I'm sorry. Yeah, so am I. I guess he was one of your oldest friends, wasn't he? You don't make any friends in this business, Evie. You can write that in your book now, and I'll give you the rest of it when I get there. You sound tired, Sam. Wouldn't you rather just... What, baby? Well, go home and, you know, just put it off until tomorrow. Or... Yeah, maybe I... Oh. oh, I'll get it off my chest tonight. Stay there, Effie. I'll come on down and dictate my report on the Dick Foley caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Shaggy? Say when? Just to the top of the glass. Oh, that's enough. You spill it? Yeah. Sam, what you said over the phone about not making any friends in this business? You didn't really mean that, did you? Forget it. You can label this, you know, a file on Dick Foley. Date, fill it in. Yes, Sam. To uh, Dundee at Homicide, I guess, from uh, Samuel Spade, license number 137596. The facts are all here. If you can dig a formal statement out of it, you're welcome. I'd known Dick Foley ever since I took out my license. We'd worked several big capers together back in my days as a continental lot. He and Mickey Linehan and I. Then he and Mickey opened their own office, Foley and Linehan, Private Investigations. Five years back, Mickey stopped the slug, and since then, the sign on the door read Dick Foley Detective Agency. I'd seen Dick maybe four or five times in the last half a dozen years just to have a drink and chew the fat about the good old days. He never talked about his private life. I assumed he didn't have any. So when I went to his office the day before yesterday in response to his call, I was surprised to find him in a clinch with one of the most beautiful nails I've ever seen. <coughs> oh. oh. Oh, oh, Sam. I don't know. Shall I uh, come back after lunch? Oh, uh, uh, Sam, this is Maxine, my wife. Well, you don't deserve it, but I'm happy for you. <laughs> I'll return the compliment, Sam. I have wanted to meet you for years, but Dick wouldn't introduce me. Now you know why. Hmm. Well, uh, you run along, honey. Sam's here on business. Hi, right, Dick. You can bring Sam home to dinner if you like. There's plenty. If he's not too busy, but don't count on that. Well, try anyway, won't you, Sam? I will indeed. Bye now. Draw up a chair, Sam. Hmm? Sit down. Oh. Uh, yeah. uh, what's on your mind, Dick? You remember Claude Spicer, that grifter I sent over for that jewelry store hike back in 43? You never told me you were married, Dick. I'm very happily married. Now, please pay attention. Uh, uh, Claude Spicer, yeah. Yeah, I remember the caper. Wasn't there a dame involved? Well, Spicer had a girlfriend, but the, the cops gave her a good bill of health. Spicer went up for a five-year stretch, and they spun him last month. Whatever happened to that thing? Uh, now, look, about Spicer. He gunning for you? You hit it. How scared of him are you? Well, enough to ask you for help, Sam. What's eating him? Just revenge? Sam, I wouldn't tell this to anybody but you. But all the facts of that caper didn't come out at that time. Uh, I, uh, sort of it. How come? Well, I couldn't have stayed in business in San Francisco if it had been generally known that my partner was the inside man on a jewelry store heist. Mickey? Yeah, Mickey Linehan. Ah, you and I are both great at choosing partners, Sam. They both deserved what they got. Only one difference. I sent up the killer to plug my partner. Some people thought the way you gave evidence that Spicer's murder trial wasn't so hot. Well, he was alibi Sam. In fact, the robbery was his alibi for the murder. I don't know how he managed it. I've been trying for five years to figure it out. 
Spicer's afraid I might succeed someday. That's why he's out to get me. What's he waiting for? Oh, I don't know. He won't do it simple. He'll have a fancy plan like the other time. He's tricky. Where's he staying? At the Belvedere. Here's his mug. I kept a plan in the building for a couple of days, but he stayed holed up in his room. I think he spotted me. Okay, Dick, I'll give it a buzz. Now, wait a minute, Sam. Yeah? I'm not asking you to do this for love. Standard fee, 25 and whiskey money. Okay? Forget it. This one's on me. In the elevator on my way out, I studied a picture of Claude Spicer on the old police circuit that Dick had given me. But a picture in the back of my mind kept getting him away. It was Dick Foley's wife, Maxine. When I hit the street, I still saw her face before me, and it was no picture. Only pretty as. Sam, I waited for you. I've got to talk to you. My pleasure. Shall we uh, confer in an adjacent cafe? Whatever you say. Only I don't want Dick to know. Then you should have married a detective. Please, Sam. How's this? Uh, black watch. Yeah. Looks dark enough. Oh, that booth in the corner, it's secluded. Why not? Slide in. Oh, no, over here, still, but not facing the street. Oh, sorry. I'm not much good at this sort of thing. Sam, I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but if he's in really bad trouble, I think I have a right to know. What makes you think he's in trouble? Well, I'm not blind. You can't live with a man and not sense it when something goes wrong. I never thought Dick was the type to show it. Oh, he's, he's tried to hide it from me, and I haven't said anything. I thought if he wanted me to know, he'd tell me. It was a wise thought. Hold on to it. Well, I meant to. But then a terrible possibility crossed my mind. Sam, it isn't me, is it? In what way? Well, you know what I mean. He's been away from home nights so much lately, and he questions me so closely about where I go and who I see and so on, and I... Well, I may as well ask you right out. Did he hire you to check up on me? Then that is it. No. You're not lying to me, Sam. Why should I? Dick says you're almost his oldest friend. He's talked so much about you. Well, he must have told you I don't do that type of work. Why do you keep looking at me? If... Sorry, trying to place you, Maxine. I keep thinking I've seen you someplace before. Oh, it must have been my picture. I was an actress. Yeah. Picture? Yeah, maybe that was it. Why do you say it like that? Like what? Was well, if you were angry with me. Because I just got the caption on the picture. Well, Sam, wait. Come back. Yes, I had. And the caption was from a newspaper circa 1943. And it read, Actress Lovely Cleared in Lanahan Slain. I flashed my tin star at the room clerk at the Belvedere, learned that Claude Spicer was in, and stuck around to make sure the clerk didn't buzz the room to tip him off. Around 4 in the p.m., Spicer went out, very dressed up, umbrella, gloves and all. He walked down Geary to Grant and turned north. A cold San Francisco drizzle started blowing up in the bay. I wish I'd brought my overcoat. A half a block up from California, he entered Grayson's jewelry store. I peeked through the rain streak show window after him. Inside, pawing eagerly through a tray full of diamond clips while a long-suffering clerk eyed her hopelessly from his side of the counter was the actress lovely. Maxine shot Spicer a quick glance of recognition as he entered, but they didn't speak. He took up a pose of gentlemanly patience, shrugged his eyebrows sympathetically at the clerk, and leaned elegantly on his umbrella while Maxine found fault with every piece of jewelry that was shoved in front of him. The bored expression left his face only once. That was when the clerk opened the vault and brought out some unset stones. Their act may have been fooling the clerk, but it was as plain as the nose on Spice's face, a very plain nose it was, that they were sizing up the joint for a pushover. Maxine left first. He stayed long enough to buy a cigarette ladder and then followed her out. As I took out after him, I stopped to read the sticker on the inside of the glass door. It said, These promises protected by Dick Foley Detective Agency. Maxine was waiting for him at the corner. I grabbed up a Chinese newspaper and used it to listen behind me. But I needn't have bothered. They didn't seem to care. Well, are you happy? Ought to be about a million bucks. Why are you so disagreeable? You ought to be feeling good. Feeling good? Five years stretch, I come out to find my girl married to the joker that sent me up. You didn't think it was such a bad idea at the time. Well, I do now. Well, after tonight, we'll go east. You and me together, baby. He'll catch up with us wherever we go. Oh, you shouldn't live so long. How do you mean that? Just like it sounds, baby. 
Bye. Oh, don't leave. I'm going to get some sleep. I need a clear head. Claude, I, I don't want to be alone. Oh, not even tonight? I don't want to be alone. <laughs> See you later, honey. Bye-bye. He went straight back to the Belvedere. No stops. Picked up his key at the desk. No messages. Took the elevator to the eighth floor. Let himself into room 809. Hung out the do not disturb sign. Closed and locked the door behind him. I kept a plan on it till around midnight. Then I lifted the do not disturb card from the doorknob and wedged it into the crack of the door. It was a crafty move, and I had just finished doing it craftily when the door opened again in my face. Huh? Who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, uh, nothing, sir. Uh, I, I, I'm making a survey. What? Uh, I'm from the Trotter Pole. Trotter Pole. It's like the Gallup Pole, but we're not in so much of a hurry. Yeah? Just, uh, kindly answer this question. As a Democrat, do you believe... Do we, huh? I picked up the Do Not Disturb card and wedged it back into the crack of his door. As any house tech knows, except, of course, Tiny Stover, the night paper at the Belvedere... If anybody opens the door like that, the card will fall out, and somebody will always hang it on the knob. Another thing Tiny doesn't know is never to draw to an inside straight. We played nine different kinds of poker until 5 a.m. when I thought I'd go up and have another look. All was quiet on the eighth floor. From the elevator bank, I could see room 809. The morning paper was shoved under his door, and my do not disturb sign was apparently where I had planted it. I tiptoed up to make sure. Huh? Who are you? What do you want? Uh, me? Uh, the paper boy, sir. Your morning paper. You get around. Well, well. Good news in the paper, sir? Interesting, interesting. Jewelry store heist up on Grant Avenue. Oh, yes, sir. Our paper only comes... What? I grabbed the paper from under 805. It was the headline I could have expected if Spicer had left his room without my knowing it. Grayson's Jewelry Store, the shop he and Maxine had cased that afternoon, had been taken for an estimated million bucks in uncut gems. But Spicer's door hadn't been opened, and there was no other exit. I sat down and thought. And what I thought of was that that sticker on the front door of Grayson's said, These Premises Protected by Dick Foley Detective Agency. On the 6 a.m. Oakland ferry boat fell his way blindly out of a slip. Claude Spicer was aboard, and so was I. Should have been getting lighter, but it wasn't. The fog was thickening over the harbor, and most of the passengers were inside drinking coffee. Spicer didn't go in. He climbed up to the boat deck and stood at the rail under the pilot's house. I planted between two wet paint signs and waited. Not for long. I couldn't make out any features of the man who came up and joined us. They stood face to face, not more than a foot apart, and talked in voices that couldn't get to me through the racket of the foghorns in the harbor. What spoke loud enough for me to hear was a gun. They seemed to fall into each other's arms and collapsed in a heap on the deck. And when I got to the spot, only the dead one was there. It was Spicer. The other man had disappeared around the corner of the deck house. A ray of light from the pilot's window swept over him, and I saw a gun metal shine in his hand and then spin out over the rail as he threw it. What? Oh, it's you, Sam. Oh, it's a frigid lost one. What did you do it for, Dick? I had my reason, Sam. Now, trust me, I'll keep you in the clear. How long? As long as I go on playing sucker for you? What do you think I hired you for? Maybe I was supposed to say you killed him in self-defense. Maybe I was supposed to see him making passes at your wife if you needed that. But Sam, you've got I've to... worked for killers before. I've even worked for thieves. But not for a detective that knocks over a place he's supposed to be protecting. Sam, it's not a Sam, it's for the cop stick. I'm turning you in when we get to Oakland. No, you're not, Sam. Then come back here. Let go of me. I'm going over the side. If you try to stop me, you'll go with me. He fought away from me, got one foot over the rail, and kicked out at me with the other. It caught me in the point of the chin. I stumbled forward and grabbed out blind. I must have caught him by the belt just as he jumped. I remember something pulling me halfway over the rail and trying to get free of it. I did, but not soon enough. I was in midair, and the black water came rushing up to me. And now, back to the Dick Foley caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I found myself mechanically keeping afloat somehow and trying to get out of my coat. 
I felt heavy and wad as if I'd swallowed gallons of water. The murk went low and thick. There was nothing else to be seen anywhere. I swallowed what felt like several more gallons before I got rid of the coat. From out of a misty fog blanket, from every direction, in a dozen different keys, from near and far, a fog horn sounded. I stopped swimming and floated on my back, trying to determine my whereabouts. After a while, I picked out the moaning, evenly spaced blast of the Alcatraz siren. But they came out of the fog without direction. It seemed to beat down on me, just straight above. I was somewhere in San Francisco Bay, and that was all I knew. And I suspected the current was sweeping me out toward the Golden Gate. And a light came up ahead of me, suddenly. A boat passing a few yards away. I lifted my head and screamed. But the boat siren, crying its warning, drowned out my shouts. Went on past, and the fog closed in behind it. Then I heard a new sound. Seagull. I swam towards it, and it seemed to get lighter. Part of it was the dawn light beginning to cut through the fog blanket. But there was also a strange-looking man standing on the water and waving a green lantern back and forth. I yelled at him to wait for me, and the seagull got off his hat and flew away. When I got closer, I saw it was not a man, but only a buoy, a channel pipe. I used all the strength I had left to drag myself up on the base of it and let it rock me to sleep. Hey, me. Oh. Put some more of the brandy into him, Gus. Yeah. Here. Get some of these down. <laughs> Where are we? Hey, it ain't heaven. You can tell that by the smell. Oh, the fisherman's wharf. Yeah, take it easy. We got ambulance coming. You going to the hospital? No. No. No, I'll, I'll be okay. Hey, give me a hand. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hey... You do us a favor, will you? Don't fall down till you get out of sight this time. We're tired of picking you up. I thanked the two kindly old fisher folk for their interest in my welfare, plotted up the pier, fell into a taxi, and went home. While I soaked out some of my aches and pains and chills, I did some stewing about the caper so far and stewed up enough anger to carry me through to the finish. I checked the Coast Guard for news of Dick Foley. They told me his body hadn't been recovered yet. I got dressed and went over to his office. The cops hadn't been there. I went through the file cabinet. And what I found on the Foley private had me so interested that I didn't hear Maxine come in until she closed the door. What are you looking for? You, baby. I'm for you. Sam. Come here. Oh, Sam. Mm, nice. Huh? Uh, who are you? Now, don't be mad, Maxie. The gun makes a woman bulge in the wrong place. It's not my gun. We'll see. Sam, I... Shut up. Now, starting with the rap Spicer went up for, the same pattern. The way you work, this one tells me how you worked it the first time. You, you get something on a private detective. The first time, five years ago, it was Dick's partner, Mickey Linehan. I don't know what Spicer had on him, but I do know he forced Dick to knock over Grayson's jewelry store last night. I won't listen to you. Okay, I'll talk to myself. I'm not saying you killed Mickey Linehan, but Dick did frame an alibi for you, didn't he? Didn't he? Oh, you're hurting me. Good. Try spending a night swimming around in circles in the middle of the harbor sometimes. See how you like that. All right, it's true. Dick did help me out of that old jam. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud our love was that important to him. No, Spicer. That same old double cross. Only this time, I'm standing where Dick did five years ago. Dick was set up as a patchy the same way Mickey Linehan was, but he got smart and pulled the trigger first. Stop it. Stop it. Where did that hurt? You fool. I love Dick. Yeah. I loved him. That's something you can't understand. But it happens that way, no matter what people are. You sound as if you really mean that. But you're a little late, aren't you? He's not dead, I'm sure he isn't. If he's not, he's really in trouble. What do you mean by that? I found something here in the files that Dick left, just in case Spicer got to him first. What is it? A confession to Mickey Linehan's murder. That's impossible. Were you there? What are you going to do with it? Turn it over to the police. But if he's still alive... It still counts, unless he shows and revokes it, but I don't think he will. Why? Because I won't back up a self-defense play on the Spicer shooting. But you were Dick's friend. You were his friend. I wouldn't ask him to do it for me. Then what can I do for him? I'll do anything, anything, anything at all. Well, if he stays away, he's as good as dead. If he comes back, you'll get a jury trial. And if there are more men than women in the panel, he'd probably be acquitted on your testimony alone. 
Do you really think he might have a chance? For the jury, there's always a chance. Well, where is he? How can I get word to him? Well, if he's not fish food by now, there's one sure way of smoking him out. Something I can do. Nobody else. Oh, please, tell me anything. Sign a confession of your own. Confession? Not Mickey Linehan's murder or anything they might nail you for. Swear that you shot Spicer. Huh? Now you can always renege. Make both of you look good, sacrificing for each other. How about it? Uh, all right. Tell me what you write. I did. She signed it. I had Effie dispatch it to all the papers and news services, and then I brought it down to the hall. Naturally, you didn't believe a word of her confession, Dandy, but when I took you aside and explained my stratagem, you endorsed it heartily and had her book. She pressed my hand and thanked me. The look of resignation on her face was so real, it was hard to believe she was faking. When she turned her back to follow the matron down the corridor, I saw why. On the back of her coat, there was a smear of white paint. I remembered the wet, the wet paint signs on the Oakland ferry boat. Dick Foley gave himself up an hour after her confession hit the street. Screamed and yelled at everybody in homicide, trying to convince them that Maxine was innocent and he should take the full rap. And I'm afraid I cleared that when we confronted him with the autopsy surgeon's report. He tried to bluff even then when he read it. Halliday ended right side between third and fourth ribs, penetrated left lung. Pellet B, pleural membrane, side wound, punctured. Well, so what, Sam? All three on the right side, angling up, you see? No! I don't know why... You even saw me on that boat. You saw me throw the gun over Oh, it. cut it out, Dick. What I saw was in the dark. That you two men were facing each other directly. If I were going to drop a man fast at close range, face to face like that, I would not put the gun in my left hand, twist it around, straining my wrist in the process, and pull the trigger with my thumb. Unless I were left-handed, double-jointed, and a trickier shot than you are. I'd blast them straight through the middle. All right. All right, yes, it was Maxine. Yeah. Well, that's good. Maybe you can get cured now. Why don't you open up some more? Let me put it down like it was business. All right, sir. Number one. Maxine killed your partner, Mickey Linehan, five years ago. Probable motive to eliminate him and send Spicer up for it. Yeah, yeah, she... She didn't figure on Spicer being smart enough to confess to the robbery, and that alibied him for the murder. Two. You purged yourself to clear Maxine of the murder. Motive? To prevent the truth about your partner from coming out, and Maxine was motive enough for anything. Cut it out, will you? Sorry. Three. Spicer forced you to team up with him in the jewelry heist. How? Well, he threatened to make a full confession as accessory to Mickey's killing. I would have put the whole works on Maxine and leave him in the clear. Yeah. Can't be tried twice for the same crime. Four. You decided to rub out Spicer, whether you could beat the rap or not, and clear the books once and for all. So you pretended to play along with him, told Maxine to do the same, and called me in as umpire. Yeah, yeah. I'm... Sam, I'm sorry. I... Why couldn't you lay off Maxine? Why did you have to... Oh, I thought you were my friend. And that's about it. Period. End of friendship. Oh. You mean the confession that you tricked her into making turned out to be... That's it, Abby. Oh. What'll happen to him? Hmm? What about Dick Foley? Dick? Oh, they got him on a number of things, I suppose. They take some time on him. But I think you'll be an okay guy again. With her out of the way. With her out of the way. Sam. Uh, go and type it up, will you? It's late. I want to get out of here. Well, here it is, Sam. I know how you must feel, so I won't... What's your hurry? Well, I thought the... Well, you know how you always feel. Look, you? sweetheart, Dick Foley was a private dick. So what? You mean you can bring yourself to talk about it? Sure. Go ahead. Try me. Well, Sam, it seems terribly complicated... I suppose because Mr. Foley was in the profession and thinks like you do. Up to a point, Effie. What's bothering you? Well, why did he call you in? You, another private detective, and he knew how smart you are and all, and... Yeah. And... I don't know, maybe if I... Well, if I turned up anything, I'd look the other way. Do you think that could ever happen to you, Sam? 
That's a clever phrase you dictated. He called me in as umpire. That's baseball. But if he was so clever, why didn't he win? His mistake, Emmy, was trying a quadruple play, which has never been heard of in the history of baseball or crime. All he wanted was to bat Maxine home safe. But he usually figures when three men are out, the side of the tires. Oh, well, I don't understand baseball, Sam. Yeah, that's all right. Football will be here soon anyway. Oh, but I don't... Good night, Libby. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.